It's good to see everybody here this morning. Just glad to be in the house of God today. And uh, I know God is ministering. He's moving in this place. And uh, you're hungry people, I believe. Hungry for the things of God, passionate about it. And I just believe, I just have a stirring in my spirit, just, just praying this morning. I just believe some of you are just like on a threshold of your breakthrough in, in life in some areas. I just really felt that. And I think heaven's looking for agreement today. You know, there's things that God has for us and heaven has for us that we've got to partner with heaven. God's looking for our, our partnership. He's, he's looking for our cooperation to cooperate with him. And I think if we agree with heaven today, I think there's going to be some things released in your life. There's going to be things that's going to break through in your life when we agree with heaven. So I just kind of really felt that just in my spirit this morning, just kind of a stirring and, and, and God just, I think he's doing some things in our lives. We don't even realize under the surface what he's doing and, and opening up doors in our lives. And so I just really feel like some of you are just on the threshold of a breakthrough in your life. So if we agree with heaven today, say God to, to have your way in our lives, I, I believe God will do it if we, we beat him in that place of faith. So amen. Well, I'm just glad to be able to give the word this morning. It's always a privilege and an opportunity uh, to give the Word of God, and uh, I just had a word on my heart this morning. I believe it's for some of you today, and uh, we're going to get into Hebrews chapter 10 this morning, um, in verse 32. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32. We're going to jump in that. If you want to stand for the reading of the Word this morning, let's stand for that. If you were there, say Amen. Hebrews 10, 32, it says this, But recall the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me and my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. We're going to stop there this morning, and I'm going to open up in prayer. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for your word today. I thank you, God, for the power of your word. I thank you for us just leaving with a renewed faith today, that we leave change, Father. We leave this, Lord, expecting you to move in our lives and do great things in our lives. So I just thank you for a renewal today, a recharging today from your word and from your presence this morning, that we just agree with heaven what you have for us in our lives today, God. So I just thank you for the word today. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for ministering and speaking today through this word, Father, in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, I think one of the challenges in, in our culture today, we can probably all agree to this, is we're very impatient people. We don't like to wait. It's a challenge for us to wait. We just don't like it. I mean, we have now like instant coffee, instant mashed potatoes, uh, instant mac and cheese. It's like we don't have the time even to make food. It's, everything's got to be instant. It's got to be right now. Got to have it right now. And with technology, the way it's evolving and it's moving, just everything is getting faster and faster. I remember at my grandma's, she had a rotary phone. You know, he's, you did that and just take forever to, to roll it over. And now we just have these phones. You're just like, hey, call Johnny. And immediately it calls him. Just things are moving faster and faster. And I don't know if you remember the days of dial-up internet when that first came out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, that was, I remember I was in like junior high school and you get online. It took forever to get online and you could do instant messaging. And then you get like kicked off of it and then get back on and, you know, to load a web page, you could go and make a sandwich and come back. And it's like, man, it's finally loading. It was just so awesome. And now things got to be so much faster. They got to be like 100 megabyte per download speed now. It's just like it's not fast enough. Everything just needs to be faster and faster. We just don't like to wait. We, we can be impatient. And one of the things I don't like to wait in is lines. I really do not like lines. I'm thankful for fast passes at amusement parks. That is like a blessing from Jesus to avoid the lines. I'm just so thankful for those things. I don't like lines in, in Walmart. I really struggle with that. Um, you know, I try to find the fastest line I can get in, the shortest line. I'm like analyzing and scanning. And a lot of times I pick the line. There's normally like a price check in that line or something's going wrong. The line I was going to go in, they just like 20 people went through it. I always pick the wrong line. We just don't like to wait. And fast food is never fast enough, I don't think. 
It's like, it's never fast. It's fast. I feel sorry for people that work in the fast food. If you work in fast food, bless you. That is a tough job. I've never worked it, but I can only imagine the stress because you've got to make those hamburgers, cheeseburgers, fries so fast. It's like, it's never fast enough. Our expectation, if it's not like under three minutes, that wasn't fast enough. I mean, we are just impatient people. We don't like to wait. And sometimes in life, we find ourselves in a waiting zone of life. We find ourselves in this place of waiting in a waiting zone in life. And, and oftentimes in these places, we're, we're wondering, we're wrestling, we're wrestling with our faith and saying, God, this is taking way too long, God. I, I thought this was going to pass by now. Maybe something you've been believing for since maybe 2014, you haven't seen it come to pass in your life. We're in this place of waiting where God gives us a promise, but it's not yet. There's something we're waiting on, a manifestation of life that God has promised to us, and we haven't seen it come to pass yet. We find ourselves in this place of waiting, and there's this internal conflict over this external circumstance that's not lining up with internal reality. There's this eternal conflict on the inside of us, what we see externally. In other words, what we see around us, what we see with our eyes and our sights, not lining up to maybe what God had said. So there's this internal conflict on the inside of us that we're fighting with, that we're, we're wrestling with. And oftentimes when we go into the, the waiting zone, we enter into the danger zone of our faith. Because oftentimes when we get in this place, in the waiting zone, the danger zone, of our faith. This is where the enemy comes in and he becomes the accuser. He brings accusations against the character and nature of God. He's like, you know what? Is God really faithful? Maybe God didn't. He's not really going to do that. I don't think he really said that. Maybe God's not really going to save your family or save your spouse. Maybe that healing's not going to come to pass. Maybe God didn't really say that because if he would have done it, he would have done it by now if he really loved you. I mean, come on. God's not really faithful. I mean, really, look at your life. You're a mess, too. You think you're worthy of the promise? You think God would bless you and make that come to pass? Look at your life. Look at the mess that you are. You're not worthy of that promise to receive what God has for you. And he begins to hit us in this place, in the danger zone, in this waiting zone of our faith, where it becomes a crisis of belief when we're in this place and we begin to wrestle with our faith. And oftentimes in this place, we begin to doubt or begin to question or lose our way. And this is where the enemy comes to try to get your faith, try to steal your faith, because that's what he wants to take your faith. He doesn't want your stuff, but he wants your faith that if he can give you to lay down, to give up, to quit, you will forfeit the promise that God has for your life. That's what he is after just to get you to quit, get you to lay down, say, you know what? I'm just tired of believing. I'm in disappointment. I'm in frustration. Maybe God's not going to do it in my life. That's where he wants to get you. And oftentimes we get in this place, we begin to doubt. We begin to question and we begin to lose our way sometimes in this place, in the waiting zone. But how many know that we are people of promise? We are a people of promise and our God is a God of promise. And that's the reality of who we are. You were born into promise. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1.20 that the promises of God in him are yes and in him, amen. The promises of God are in him are yes and in him, amen. You know, Paul says you can have the promises of God. How does that happen? God says yes, and we say amen. Yeah. God says yes, and we say amen. Can I be blessed? Yes. Can I be healed? Yes. Can I have peace? Yes. Can I have joy? Yes. Can my kids be saved? Yes. God says yes, and we say amen. We agree with what God says. God says yes, and we say, let it be done. Let it happen in my life. His promises are yes and amen. And what promises do is they create expectation. They create expectation, the expectation that God bursts through promises, pull us into the future. They pull us in the future. It's what keeps us up and keeps us going every day, the promises. For an example, you could say, I could tell my kids, hey, I promise I'm going to take you to the movies Friday night. It's like a Monday or something like that. We're going to go to the movies and we're going to have a good time. And in their mind, it builds up this, uh, this excitement and expectation and of looking forward to that. They begin to create in their minds what that's going to look like and what it's going to be like when they go to, to the movies. And there's this expectation. And, and my kids, I can't tell them on Monday. I had to tell them the day of because like, yeah, on Tuesday, they're going to wake up and be like, Dad, is it Friday yet? And on Wednesday, is it Friday yet? Is it Thursday? Is it time to go to the movies yet, Dad? There's this expectation that keeps them moving every single day. 
And with promises, it builds up a picture in my, our minds. We, we take it and we think this is maybe what it's going to look like or what it's going to be. We build up this picture in our minds what that promise may be. And Joseph, he had a dream that created a promise in his life. If you read throughout the Bible, he had a promise over his life, a dream that God gave him. I mean, it was a great promise that God had given him. Mean, he's going to be a guy in authority and a, a leader. And in his mind, I'm sure he built up what this is going to be like and the expectation of, of what that promise and how it was going to be fulfilled and manifest in his life. But it did exactly the opposite of probably what he pictured in his mind. I mean, it didn't go the way probably he planned at all. I mean, what happened was his brothers throw him in a pit to try to kill him. He's, he's sold into slavery. He's falsely accused in prison for something he didn't even do. I mean, this guy went through a lot of stuff. And I'd be like, God, are you sure that you said that? Because it's not looking like it right now. I mean, everything on the outside does not look like what you said for my life. I can't imagine being in that place. Everything around him was not looking like that God was going to do and fulfill that promise in his life. But God did fulfill the promise that he had spoken over his life. He fulfilled that dream in his life. Sometimes the, the greater the distance between the promise and the fulfillment of the promise is the greater arena for disappointment, frustration, and delusion to come in our lives. The greater the distance between the two, we begin to wrestle sometimes with disappointment and frustration. For example, I could say maybe one day I tell my wife, hey, I'm going to be home at five o'clock. We're going to have dinner. It's, it's date night. And uh, she's, you know, has this expectation. I'm going to be home at five o'clock. She's excited. She's going to make dinner and have the table ready, have candles lit, maybe play some music to, you know, set the mood, mood or whatever, you know. And uh, she's just excited. But, you know, as I leave, maybe I stop by the Dollar General and I run into Johnny, who I haven't seen. And maybe uh, since high school, and we begin to talk and, and all of a sudden, 45 minutes pass. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I lost track of the time. I got to get home. And, and then I go home. And I get caught in traffic. And then all of a sudden, it's like 630. And I, I come in the door and I find my wife who's a little frustrated, a little upset, maybe a little angry because I didn't keep that promise, I didn't fulfill that promise of being there at, at five o'clock. You know, the Bible talks about that promises unmet and unfulfilled become hope deferred. It, it makes the heart sick. And you may have a promise over your life today that maybe it's not been met or maybe it's not been fulfilled, but I came to encourage you today that our God is a faithful God. Amen. He is a faithful God. If God promised you to to you. He will perform that promise. He will do what he said he would do in, in your life. He is faithful. You may not know how it's going to come, where it's going to come from, how it's going to happen. It may not make sense in your natural mind how God's going to do it, but he is going to do it because God is faithful to his word. He's faithful over and over again. You look throughout the Bible, it's a faithful God being faithful to a people who are oftentimes faithless. The Bible talks about he is faithful when we're even faithless. That's how faithful, that's how good that he is. He's going to fulfill that promise in our lives. And the temptation comes when we're in this waiting zone, this place. We want to give up and say, you know what, I'm going to forfeit that promise. But you've got to get in the place and say, what? Well, I'm going to stand my ground in this place. I'm going to believe God. I'm not going to forfeit over the promise, but I'm not going to walk by what I see, but I'm going to walk by faith because there's a greater one living on the inside of me. You've got to stand up in that place and say, I believe God. I'm not going to walk by what I see, what's all around me, but I'm going to walk by faith. You know, the opposite of faith is not fear, it is sight. In other words, your life is going to be led by what you see or what you believe. It's going to be led by what you see and what you believe. So I'm determined I'm not going to be led by what I see, but I'm going to be led by what I believe. And I believe God and I believe his word. I believe that he's faithful. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. He changes not. And I want to raise a level of my expectation up to the level of the promise that God has in my life because he is faithful. You watch what he do, will do in your life. He will do it. He promises he will do it. Even though if you haven't seen it yet, maybe you're in a place of disappointment. Raise your level of expectation. Up. God's wanting us to raise our level, our expectors back up again because God is going to do it. He's waiting for us to come and set the stage of faith and he will perform that promise in your life. Oftentimes when we find ourselves in this place of waiting in the waiting zone, some things just to look at Oftentimes we see God as being silent and God being silent is not an indication that he's absent. He, if he's silent, it's not an indication that he is absent. 
God is not absent from your circumstances, from your environment, from your life. He is present. He is there. God says this, I I promise I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be with you until the end of the age. I will never, ever, ever leave you. That is an awesome promise that he says, you know what? I'm not going to leave you. Are you thankful today that God says, I'm not going to leave you? He says, I will not leave you. Not only be with you, but I'll be in you. He takes it to the next level. That is awesome. You know what that means? That means when I don't see him, when I don't feel him, when I don't hear him, he is there. He is there. And that has to become a confident reality in my life. A confident reality that I know, that I know, that I know deep down in my canoe that he is with me. He's not far off, far off in heaven, but he's here right now. And he knows what I need before I even say it. That's how close he is to you. God didn't say, I'll just be with you when you're believing and not when you're not believing. I'll just be with you when you're good and when you're not good. He said, I will be with you always until the end of the age. So I have to recognize in the moment of my silence, in the moment when I'm struggling and fighting by myself, that God is with me. He is there. He is present. Just because God is silent, it's not an indication that God is absent. He is there with us, right there with us when we're walking through this place of waiting and maybe the unknowns in our lives. The second thing here to look at and as we're going through this waiting process, sometimes in this waiting zone, there's often, there's a time and there is a test. There's a time and there's a test. Here's what it says in Psalms 105, 19. It's talking about Joseph's word. It says, until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. It says, until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. Sometimes when we find ourselves in this waiting zone, there is, there is a time and there is a test. It's talking about his word. That H is not capitalized, but it's lowercase. That is Joseph's word. Until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. We can say this word tested, it's, it's proving him. It's refining him. It's talking about purifying metal. It's this purification process that he's going through. And he's not testing him to see if he's worthy of the promise. He's not testing him to see if he's worthy of the promise. It's not the test that created the promise, but it's the promise that created the test. Nowhere does God grant his promises based upon our performance. It's it's the promise that created the test. And since there was a a promise, the word of the Lord tested him, it says It, it proved him and it refined him. I think the battle for every believer is not to prove to God that we are worthy. It's not to to prove to to him that we are worthy because you could come to this altar and pray for four or five days straight and not get up off your knees. And it still would not be enough to prove yourself worthy of the the blessings of God. There's, There's not enough you could do to prove yourself worthy. You can't pay enough. You can't pray enough. You can't serve enough. You can't give enough. You can't do enough. You can't clean up enough to prove yourself worthy of the blessings of God. You cannot do enough. That's not the fight for every believer to prove ourselves worthy of God. But the fight of our life is to keep believing that what he did for me is sufficient enough to me to receive what he has promised. That what he has done for me is sufficient enough for me to receive what he has promised. Because everything that we receive from God comes from grace through faith. Faith. It says this in Ephesians chapter 2, 8, that we are saved by grace through faith. That's how we receive salvation, not by works, not by by boasting, but because of what Jesus has done. That's how we receive salvation. It's nothing that we have done, but everything that he has done. It comes through grace by faith. Grace makes it available and faith makes it possible. That's how we receive the promises of God. It's not anything that we do in and of ourselves, but it comes by grace through faith. And every promise that God has given us, we, we already have. He says he's given us every spiritual blessing, everything pertaining to life and godliness he has given us. It's already there. You're, try, you're not trying to get it. You've already got it. But we receive everything through grace by faith. Grace makes it available and faith makes it possible. And God was not testing Joseph to see if he was qualified for the promise. He wasn't testing him to see if he was qualified for it, but he's already qualified by God. God had already qualified him. And God's not testing us to see if we're qualified for the promise. He's not doing that. He's not, there's nothing that we can do to qualify ourselves for the promises of God. They aren't earned. They are received. And God qualified you at the cross. 
That's where he qualified you at. There's nothing that we can do to earn the promises of God. They aren't earned, but they are received. And sometimes we're trying to prove ourselves worthy of that. It comes by grace. So he doesn't test me to prove me worthy. He tests me, refines me to get me the condition necessary to operate in what he has already ordained for me. What he has already ordained for me. See, Joseph understood that there was a maturing, there was a perfecting process that was happening in his life when God was testing him in the waiting zone. If God would have fulfilled the promise when he was a teenager, man, he probably would have self-destruct. He wasn't ready for that yet. And if some things of God would have answered and prematurely in our life, we might have blown ourselves up and everybody else around us. So God in his wisdom gives you a promise that's yes and amen, and, but he gives you a season where there's perfecting and there's a refining and there's a maturing so you could walk fully in the promise that he has for you. Because God doesn't want you just to visit your promise. He wants you to possess your promise, to live from that promise, to steward that promise. So there's this perfecting that's going on in the testing and the waiting zone of our lives. James talks about like this, count it all joy, brethren, when you fall into various trials, knowing that your testing of your faith is going to produce patience. Count it all joy. How can we count it all joy? Because we know God is perfecting us. He's maturing us. He's doing something in our lives that's beyond ourselves. He's working out for the good in our lives. We can count it all joy when we fall into trials because we know God is, is working. He's working things for good in our lives. We can count it all joy. We can throw a party when these things come in our lives. And it talks about patience. Patience, it also, some translation says endurance. Endurance is the ability to remain under with the right attitude. It's the ability to remain under with the right attitude. We should come to a place in the maturity of our walk with God that people don't know if we're having a bad week or a good week. They can't tell if we've already received the promise or if it's still on its way. That we've learned that we have this ability to stay under pressure, that we keep the same attitude. That it's not predicated on our circumstances, our environments, our, our moods, but that we can remain steadfast in Him. We can remain steadfast in Him. It says this in James. It says, joy brings endurance. Endurance creates patience. And patience, when it has its finished work, creates mature man lacking nothing. You have everything you need to be completely whole. Everything to be completely whole, you, you will have. There's this testing in this waiting zone. There's also time. It talks about every promise has a due season. It says this in Galatians 6, 6 through 9. It says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will also of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. It says if we don't lose heart, if we don't grow faint, if we don't grow weary in well-doing, we're going to have a due season where that promise is going to come past in our lives. What causes me to faint? I think what causes me to faint is what I'm believing for. The energy that I'm believing for is gone, and, and it moves into a negative direction instead of a positive direction. And now I've come to the place in the life and says, what's the use? And, and I give up and I faint and I have no longer the ability to keep moving forward. But the Bible says if you don't faint, if you don't give up, if you keep moving forward, you're going to reap a harvest. You're going to have a due season in your life and that promise is going to come past in your life. There is a due season. There is an appointed time. Habakkuk says this in chapter 2, verse 2. It says, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads with it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. There comes a time where you've got to speak and declare your promise. But there will come a time where that promise will de declare itself. It will speak for itself. For example, I say, you know what, I'm, I'm the healer of the Lord. And there will be come a time where that healing will manifest. And the report will say that I am healed. The, the promise will speak of itself. It will speak of itself. Though it, though it tarries, wait for it. It will surely come to pass. Wait for it. That's what it says. And oftentimes you're like, I've been waiting a long time. I haven't seen it come to pass. Are you sure it's happening? We're wrestling and we're wondering, is it going to happen? It says, wait for it. Though it tarries, it will surely come. Wait for it. It's going to happen if you wait for it. It's going to happen in your life. And understanding this, that God's 
delays or not denials. Maybe because it hasn't happened yet. It's not that God is not going to do it yet, but he's doing something in your life. He's doing something greater in your life. Wait for it, even though it tarries, it says. There is an appointed time. There is a due season for every promise in our life. And I think when we're in this waiting zone of our lives, we have to refuse to throw away our confidence. To refuse to throw away our confidence. Our confidence is in God and, and faith in him. You know, everything that Jesus has done, his death, burial, and resurrection, he's won the victory for us. He didn't do it for him, but he did it for me and you. I can't throw my confidence away. And the Hebrews writer talks about there's going to be coming a time in your life when you get under this place of pressure of your life where the things that you were illuminated over may not happen in your life. That you get this revelation and, and maybe it's not looking like it's going to happen in your life. And this is what he says to do. He says, don't throw away your confidence. Don't throw away your confidence that I still believe God. I'm not going to throw away my confidence in who he is and what he says and his faithfulness, his nature. I believe God. I am confident that God will do it. There's a story in, in Acts talking about the apostle Paul, and he's on this ship on the way to Rome. He's a prisoner at the time. And they're out in sea in this place, and it's like the storm is just brewing, and it's like a hurricane. And it talks about they haven't seen the sun in like 14 days. I mean, it's pretty brutal. The winds are blowing, the waves are, are crashing, and he's on the ship, and it's like disintegrating the ship because it's so powerful. And the men are like throwing cargo off the ship, trying to save the ship and save, save their lives. And, and it's like he goes and excuses himself and goes into the belly of the ship. And, and the angel of the Lord appears to him and says to him, Unto, as I told you, it'll be done unto you. As I told you, it'll be done unto you. And he comes back up out of the ship and he says, be good, be of good cheer, guys. Be of good cheer. And they're like, no, why do you mean be of good cheer? I'm, you're a prisoner. It doesn't look like we're going to live here. What, what does there be a good of cheer about? And he's like, God said this to me. He says, it'll be done to you as he told me. And he says this, I believe God. I believe God. In the midst of all this, what's going on around me right now, the wind's blowing. It's like he looked at it and said, keep on blowing. I, I believe God. It's like the, the waves were crashing up against the ship. He said, keep on crashing. I believe God. The ship is like disintegrating and falling apart. He's like, I, I believe God. I believe his word. I believe he's going to do what he said he was going to do in my life. I believe God. And God's like saying, you know what? Don't try to hold on to the things that can't save you, but hold on to the things of what's going to bring you through the storm. And that is the confidence of the Lord. His confidence in the Lord. Don't throw away your confidence. Don't throw it away, but say, you know what? I'm going to be confident. I believe God. I believe his word. I believe in who he is. I've got to refuse to throw away my confidence in God. In this place, in the waiting zone, when we find ourselves. Just a couple scriptures here. It talks about, it says Psalms 130. It says this, 130 verse 5. It says, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And his word, I do hope. My soul waits for the Lord. It says this in Psalm 27, 14, wait in the Lord, be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say on the Lord. Isaiah 40, 31 says this, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That's an amazing promise right there. But the question is, what does it mean to wait upon the Lord? So we think of waiting just kind of like you know, kind of like this, just, just waiting right here, you know. We think of it as idleness and passivity. If you go to a Texas Roadhouse and you'd see a waiter just standing in the corner, just kind of waiting right there, and you'd be like, hey, waiter, what are you doing? It's like, I'm just, I'm waiting. That's what I'm doing. It's like, can you bring some of those rolls? I like some of those. Those are pretty good. We have a terrible translation in the English language of waiting. It's not passivity. It's not idleness, but it means to wait to look and to expect, to look for and to expect that maybe today's the day I'm looking that God is going to fulfill that promise. He's going to bring forth maybe that promotion in my life, that healing. Maybe it's going to happen. I'm looking, I'm expecting, I'm waiting. I believe God. Maybe today is a day he's going to do that. Maybe today is a day he's going to save that family member in my life. Maybe today is a day he's going to save my family. Maybe today is a day that God brings increase in my life. I'm waiting, I'm expecting, I'm, I'm looking for. Just like a pregnant lady, they say that she's expecting. She has a promise of a baby on the inside. 
And she begins to make preparations for that baby, begins to change the room, change the diet, begins to prepare for that promise of that baby. Even though she can't see it yet, she knows it is coming. That promise of the baby. It's the same thing with our faith that we are looking for. We are expecting. We are making preparations by faith to say, you know what? Today could be the day that God manifests that promise in my life. And I'm going to continue to believe him. Even though I haven't seen it yet, I'm not going to throw away my confidence in God. I'm not going to throw it away because I know that he is faithful, but I'm going to wait upon the Lord and he's going to renew my strength. I'm going to wait upon him. He's, he's going to do that. God is a faithful God. He is so, so faithful. I mean, I've seen his faithfulness over and over again in my life. And it's like, God, I did not deserve that. But it's not based upon what I do. It's out of his goodness, out of his heart, out of his grace. And I just respond in faith to him, to what he's already done. There may be promises over your life that God has made. Maybe it's not yet. Maybe you find yourself in that, that waiting zone, that place where it hasn't happened. You're like wondering, you're wrestling. When is this going to happen in my life? And I just want to encourage you today that God is faithful. If he said it, he is going to do it. You can take it to the bank. God will do his word. He will perform his word. And when we set the stage with our faith, God will perform it. He will do it in your life. And I want to raise my level of expectation up with my level of the promise that God has for my life. Let's raise our expectors. Let's begin to, to believe God. Let's begin to believe that God is with us. He's not far away, but he knows what we need. Even though there's a testing going on, there's a timing going on that we can walk confidently that he's, he's with us and that we won't throw away our confidence in him, but say, you know what, God, I believe you. And all your promises are yes and amen. And we just agree with heaven today. And we agree with you. So I just want to pray for us today, this morning. And maybe you've been in that place today. And I just want the praise and worship to come up at this time. I just ask them to play this song. And you might find yourself in this place of the waiting zone this morning where it's, you've had a promise spoken over your life. And maybe you're in this place of maybe dis disappointment or frustration and, and just wondering and wrestling, God, when is this going to happen in my life? And maybe you've gotten to the place, you know, I just give up. I quit. It's not going to happen. Obviously, it's not going to come true, God. It's been all this time. And maybe the enemies come into your life and begin to, to accuse and accuse the nature and the, the character of God and say, you know what? God's not really faithful. God's not going to really do it. Look at all this time that's passed. God is, he's not going to do it. You're not worthy of that promise anyway. Maybe that's been you today. It's like, you know what? I want to believe God again. I want to take him at his word. I want to believe that he's faithful and that he will perform his word. If that's you today, I just want you to take a step of faith. We just stand this morning in this, as we sing this song. If you just want to come up as we sing this song, just saying, you know what? Take a step of faith and say, you know what? I believe God this morning. I believe him in his word. I'm going to raise my level of expectation up to my, the level of the promise over my life. You say, you know what? I believe God did. I believe that he's faithful. I'm just going to ask you to take a prophetic act and take, walk up to this front here as we begin to sing this song and say, you know what? God, I'm agreeing with heaven today. I'm agreeing for what you have for my life today. Lord, that your promises are yes and amen in you. That we just come to the front here this morning and say, you know what, God, I'm taking a stand of faith today. I'm not going to walk by what I see, but I'm going to walk by faith this morning. So as we sing this morning, let's just believe God, begin to trust him in these areas of our lives. And I believe that there are those, myself included, that need to leave at the altar a spirit of fear and pick up spirit of faith over that issue, over that circumstance. So we just leave the fear of it not coming through, of him not coming through, because he's faithful. Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness. You have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy, you're my help in time. Lord, I can't. 
can't help
like a good father. You always provide. You always come through. You're so good, Lord. He is faithful. Can we just give him some praise this morning? Just praise him today. Thank you, Jesus. And thank you that you are faithful, Jesus, to your promises, to your word, God. I thank you, God, that you are a good God, that you are amazing, God, that you are an awesome God, that we magnify. We agree with heaven today. We thank you, heaven. We thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing in our lives. We thank you for the promises, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. We praise you today, Father. We thank you, Jesus, for every promise today, God. We thank you today, Father. Thank you for your faithfulness, God. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for who you are. Thank you, God, that you've not left us nor forsake us, but you are with us every single moment. So we thank you today, God. We, we do say we believe you today. We believe you, Father. We put our trust in you, Father, today. So I thank you today for our strength being renewed in your presence this morning, God, that you are renewing our strength today. And I thank you for things being broken loose in our lives today, Father. I thank you for promises maybe that became dormant. I thank you for rising back to the service. We're raising our expector, our level of expectation up to our level of promise today, Father. So I thank you for fulfilling those promises. We believe you today, God, that you said it, that you will do it. We're setting up the stage today with faith today, knowing that you will perform those promises. So we just say thank you in advance, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, today for doing that, doing your word and fulfilling your promises. So I thank you today, Jesus.